Hey everybody, this is Carolyn from Homesteading Family and today I have a really great guest. I'm so excited to have her for today's pantry chat. Everybody say hi to Melissa K. Norris from Pioneering Today. Hi! Hey Carolyn! Now, you, guys are <laughs> you guys are gonna have to hang with us a little bit because both Melissa and I have really rural internet and say so we have a little bit of a latency, a little bit of delay. So there may be a little crosstalk. So just hang with us for um, today. So Melissa, you don't look like Josh. You don't have a beard. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Josh would have loved to have been here today, but he's out for the day. And uh, but we are talking when we get to the main content here. We're going to be talking about a really great topic that is hitting us all right now. And if you're a gardener, it I bet you is hitting your mailbox right now. And that's a seed catalog. So today we're going to be talking about garden planning. We all know that your great garden, the best garden starts with the planning before you ever get into the soil. So that's what we're going to be talking about in our main content today. But we usually do a little chit chat first and I roped Melissa into the regular chit chat. So if you want to skip ahead to the main content, just check the timestamps. We'll have that stamped for you in the description. Just click the see more button and you'll be able to skip on ahead to the main topic. But Melissa, what have you been up to on your homestead right now? Now you're in Washington, so you are a little warmer than we are here in Idaho, but what have you guys been up to? Yeah, we are just a little bit warmer. So I've actually been able to, this is the first year I've had them where we haven't eaten them all by this time of year, but this is the first year where I still have Brussels sprouts out in oh, oh. the garden. And so I have been going out, not every day, but definitely every week, a couple of times a week, and harvesting Brussels sprouts. I have to tell you, it kind of feels like cheating when it's in the middle of January and I'm <laughs> able to go and harvest food that I haven't preserved that's just on the shelf, but actually go out to the garden and preserve it. I'm kind of like, oh, it, it really it feels like cheating, like I'm getting away with something, but like in the best way possible. <laughs> Absolutely. Now we were talking, Josh and I were talking in one of the last pantry chats about our goals for this coming year. And one of my goals is actually to can less, not because I want to actually can less, but you know, right now I can somewhere around a thousand jars a year for our family. And so I want to get better at season extension in the garden so I can be eating Brussels sprouts out of the garden. I don't know if I can do it right now. Our garden's under about two feet of snow right now. But um, between that and root cellaring, I want to I want to do more of what you're doing. So that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I don't can as much as you because our family sizes differ. I'm probably between about four and five hundred. But I really love any of the root cellaring techniques. And we don't have a root cellar. I live in a manufactured home. Actually, we don't have a garage or a basement uh, or a barn. But like my onions and my garlic and even my winter squash and my pumpkins, those are still actually good. We had great weather for curing this year. And I'm with you. I'm like, I didn't, I did can some of my pumpkin just because I had so much. I knew we probably wouldn't get through it before it would start to turn. But I love just being able to go and pull those things, even in the house, that I didn't have to can. But I'm with you. I love canning. But if there's things that I don't have to can, it's just less labor intensive. Oh, yeah. So that's kind of my goal each year is to, to be able to extend just like you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, like I said, we're under about, I don't know, maybe 18 inches of snow right now. And then today it just turned to rain. So what a mess. It has been kind of a warm, messy winter so far. So that said, we are not doing much outside. Uh, the only thing that is standing in the garden still are some leeks that actually I left out there to see how long I can get them to go. I'm hoping they will stay good and I can harvest them first thing in the spring, but it's kind of an experiment. Um, but right now we are really focusing on the planning. So this is a perfect time to talk for us 
uh, because Josh and I are really sitting down, looking at the planning for the upcoming year and having lots of meetings about garden planning and animal planning. And, you know, we're always putting in more trees and perennial systems. So trying to figure out what the big ones are for this year. So that is a lot of what is happening around our homestead right now is just that taking advantage of that cold weather and sitting down with pencil and paper and uh, planning out the beginning part of the year. So that is a good time to be able to take advantage of the snow. <laughs> okay, we're, we're gonna... supposed to get snow. Sorry, we're supposed to get snow this weekend. Right now we're just getting lots of rain and it's kind of on and off with the clearing. And I have to say, if I'm going to have precipitation coming down this time of year, I would rather have the snow. So I'm kind of looking forward to having some snow instead of just all of the rain. Right. Yeah, we actually had so much snow in one day that it took our power out for about five, six hours, I think two days ago. And, um, you know, it's so great. I know you went through this earlier with storms that you guys got. Um, it's so great when you're prepared to live without power because it was just like a five minute hiccup and then we were back up and running the house was warm we were cooking we have the wood cook stove so that just you know stew just bubbled along on that and it just really didn't interrupt that much of the day except for laundry i didn't try to get out the hand washing on the laundry we just stopped on the laundry <laughs> took a break for the day but besides that you know we just hummed along so it's great to feel like you're just prepared and that doesn't give you any problems Yes, totally agree. And that's where I'm really happy that I have my canned food because I can just dump and heat it on the wood stove um, and not even have that many dishes to do like a lot of prep work. I can just make a big one pot meal. So yeah, it is very nice to have those preparedness things in, in line for when it happens. Absolutely. Okay, so we usually answer a few um, questions from other videos that we've done. So I'm going to rope you right into that. Today, we're going to answer two questions. The first one is from uh, Brenda R. Chambolt on the Super Greens Powder video that I did. So Melissa, I take my extra greens and wild foraged greens all spring and I dehydrate them because there's that part of the year where I just have more coming in than I can possibly eat fresh. And um, I just, you know, blanching them and freezing them is a lot of fuss, honestly. And I don't tend to do a lot of that. I always do some, but not a lot of it. So I go ahead and I dehydrate them and then I powder them and I use them for my own super greens for putting in smoothies or adding to soups or all sorts of things in the winter. In fact, right now, I put a good scoop of that into my morning smoothies that I have every morning. And when you see how many greens go down to a tiny amount of powder, you really realize how many servings of vegetables you're getting in a little scoop of that stuff. It's a lot. So, um, but Brenda is asking, do you ever use plantain leaf? Do you powder it? And yes, Brenda, I do. I put in plantain, I put in dandelion. I love putting in my carrot tops. Uh, they blend right in there. They're a great way to use them. Lots of extra uh, vitamins and you get some minerals in there with those, all of those different ones, especially those wild ones, uh, the perennials like the plantain because those bring up those minerals from so deep down in the earth with those tap roots that you really get lots of good minerals from using those plantain, the dandelion, all of those wild ones, mallows, whatever you have that's growing around that is a good green to use in, you know, we call them a pot herb when you cook, cook them up and can put them on your plate. Um, you can dehydrate any of those and put them in this mix. What do you do, Melissa, what do you do with your greens, with extra greens? Yeah, you know, a lot of my extra greens, honestly, if we're not eating them fresh, a lot of them go to the livestock because I'm always trying to cut down on our livestock bill. So, and it's funny, you were mentioning previously planning. We were just doing the same thing. We were deciding how many piglets do we want to raise this year? How many meat chickens do we want to get? How much do we have left? Because that's kind of how we determine uh, what we're going to be doing for the year. And so a lot of those extra greens, my hens, my laying hens, they love them. It'll go into the pig feed to kind of help supplement what, what we're buying because we don't raise all of our own livestock feed. So I actually use a lot of them 
uh, that way, and especially like with plantain, I actually use a lot of those extra greens, and that is what I will make my um, infused oils with to make homemade salves and you know soaps and all those different things like that. So I don't actually dehydrate as much up. I don't myself. I am not a morning, like I eat, this is going to sound stupid, I eat coffee in the morning, but I do like a bulletproof <laughs> or a fat lane in coffee in the morning. I don't do a lot of smoothies, um, so I don't do as much of the super greens like you do. I tend to use them more with the livestock or a lot with like medicinal, like I said, kind of like with those oils and stuff, unless it's just fresh mm -hmm. eating. I love fresh greens sauteed with just a little bit of onion and a little bit of garlic, almost just all by themselves, maybe an egg on top for lunch. But I think it's knowing how you're going to consume them. And if you consume them in that format for your family, and I just know personally that I don't mm -hmm. use them a ton that way, um, that we use them more fresh. So I kind of put them to use the other way. Um, but now you're making me think about how many green servings you can get in when they're dehydrated down. So maybe I need to do a few more of those this year that way. Yeah, that would be good. You can put it in all sorts of good things and hide lots of uh, nutrition for your kids. I know some people really need to hide those greens. Uh, my kids tend to be pretty good about eating their greens, but I got to say, I would not try putting the super greens in your morning coffee. I, I don't think that would be a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next question. It's from MKZ on my fermented ginger carrots video. And they ask, can I use Himalayan salt? It's all I have. Absolutely. The only salts that I try to stay away from in fermenting are your table salts and your iodized salts. The reasons for that is because they've got things in them to, that inhibit the bacterial growth. Um, iodine definitely inhibits bacterial growth. That's why they use it as an antibacterial on wounds in animals. Uh, so you don't want that to go into your, uh, your ferments. It, it will just slow them down and allow some of the other bacteria that you don't want to grow um, and not the good lactobacillus bacteria. So Melissa, what do you use? Do you have one thing that you tend to use in fermenting or do you just use whatever you have on hand? That's kind of what I do. Whatever I have in hand that I would feel is safe um, is what I use. Himalayan salt is definitely on that list. Yeah, I usually always have some of the Himalayan pink sea salt. And then I also like the um, Celtic gray sea salt. So it's kind of whichever one of those I have the most of at the moment is what goes in. Same as you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get into the main topic of garden planning. I'm super excited because Melissa just had a book come out. I don't know if it's backwards for you guys on the screen, but the family garden plan, grow a year's worth of sustainable and healthy food. And, you know, Josh and I both looked over this. You guys know how... Um, discerning Josh is about his garden material. And we were both really, really impressed. We thought this was just a great book, a wonderful, uh, just had so much information. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to be using some of the charts that are in this book. I really love it. And it's super helpful for garden planning. So if you guys don't have a copy of this yet, I would really, really recommend a copy of Melissa's book. So I'm gonna be kind of picking her brain for some of the good tidbits out of this. And Melissa, um, I'm going to let you kind of kick it off with um, your just garden experience. What, you know, what, how long have you gardened? Where did you learn to garden? Um, maybe you're like Josh and I, and there's a little bit of it in the history, plus a lot of trial and error and, and learning, but we'd love to hear a little bit of your story. Yeah. So with my husband and I, um, we've been married 20 plus years. So I've got 20 this will be my 21st year we're going into of having my own garden with us. But I was really fortunate that I would, grew up having a garden. Um, I'm a fifth generation homesteader. And so we always had a garden. In fact, it wasn't until I got like into high school, I thought everybody had a garden and, and grew their food in the summer. <laughs> I didn't realize that that wasn't normal. Uh, maybe I lived a little bit of a sheltered life. <laughs> um, so I had the experience growing up 
But what was interesting is growing up, like I, I just remember every spring going out and helping my parents in the garden. Some of my earliest memories were my mom would do the depth of the row when I was really little and I would just get to drop the seeds and I'm sure she must have went behind me and helped to space them out because I would, I mean, I'm little, little. Uh, and as I got older, she would show me like on my finger, like this is how far down you poke the hole and you put the seed in. And so I have a lot of those, those memories. And when I was growing up though, we raised a year's worth of green beans and seed saved those green beans. But the other crops that we grew were more just for fresh eating. And my mom would can up like carrots mm -hmm. and we would make our own jam and jelly. Like we didn't buy that from the store. But as far as the rest of the produce, we didn't really grow and preserve enough of those other crops to go through an entire year it was kind of just part of the year. Mm -hmm. So when my husband and I first got married, I really followed those same principles. And so I've always raised a year's worth of green beans and canned a year's mm -hmm. worth of green beans. But as I started having kids and started dealing with some health things, I realized that I really needed to be consuming our own homegrown food for multiples of reasons. And with a shorter growing season here in the Pacific Northwest, I needed to raise a year's worth in those summer months of the majority of things. Like I said, I, I get to do Brussels sprouts right now, which I'm happy about. But the majority of those annual crops needed to be raised in the summer and a year's worth preserved. So I was blessed that I just knew how much we needed on green beans because that had been modeled for me. But all the rest of the crops, I had no clue how much would take us through a year or how many that I needed, you know, and how many that my family needed now that I had two children. It wasn't just my husband and I. And that's going to vary. And so that was really what I had to do was I had to figure out for us, well, how many do I need to put in of this specific crop to take us through an entire year? And there was a ton of trial and error. I remember, I don't remember my parents growing tomatoes when I was growing up, actually. And so I remember when I decided I wanted a year's worth of tomatoes because I use a lot of tomato sauce and just so many varieties, you know, turning it into pizza sauce and pasta sauce and chilies and soups right. and stews tomato soup, all those things. And so I'm not kidding you. The first, <laughs> oh, tomatoes were my nemesis. I think the first <laughs> three years of trying to grow tomatoes, I tried them in containers. I tried them upside down, like all the things. And then blight, because we are cooler and wetter here in the Pacific Northwest, typically in the summer. Finally, on the fourth year, I finally got tomato growing down and now it's been numbers of years and I grow a year's worth of tomatoes every year and preserve them up. We don't have to buy our tomato products from the store. But I was so frustrated. I think it was just my sheer stubbornness. I have a, my dad likes to say <laughs> my mule is kicking in because I can get stubborn like a mule. <laughs> and it was sheer stubbornness that I'm like, I'm getting these tomatoes and I'm going to figure it out um, that I was able to grow a year's worth. Yeah, so that, you know, I really think that your story echoes a lot of people's stories in that, in that when you start growing, and I know Josh and I both have some family history of growing, but neither of our families was trying to do more than just eat fresh food out of the garden. So there wasn't a lot of preserving happening. So when we started gardening, the, the planning went something like this, like, oh, well, that space in the ground looks like a good amount of space. Now let's fill it up with whatever we feel like we want to stick in the ground that'll fit. You know, I mean, there wasn't a lot of planning that went into it. And honestly, that got us a long ways. We started being able to adjust from there and going, you know, that was just way too many whatever and not enough of this other thing. And so, you know, zucchini, right? It's always way too many zucchini and it's not enough tomatoes or it's not enough cucumbers, depending on where you live, whatever the hard thing to grow is. And so we've had to learn kind of the planning um, the hard way and not, you know, we've had to realize, well, you know, we could really sit down and plan this out on paper and actually end up with exactly what we needed. But it took us quite a few years to actually come all the way around to that. So I really, really like how your planning in your book starts with figuring out what you need to eat for your family. Like, I love that. There's this great chart in here that talks about how many plants, how many plants average you're gonna need for per, per person, how much you're gonna get out of that on average. And of course, this is all averages because you can't speak to anybody's soil conditions or particular garden conditions, 
but it gives this great place to start your planning from so that you don't end up with, you know, 30 bushels of zucchini and a handful of tomatoes by the end of the summer. Yeah. And I, you know, the way I actually start it, even before you get to the chart, and I'm so glad you brought up the averages because it is true, even incremental weather that we can have in soil condition, et cetera. So they're definitely averages. Um, but I, ha I needed to look at, because I, I don't know about you, but I had gardening years, especially earlier, where just like you said, I would have way too much of something. And then I discovered it was something that I don't know why I even planted a whole bunch of it because we didn't even really like it <laughs> even fresh, let alone preserved. <laughs> I was like, this is stupid. So I really went to and looked at my meal planning and what we were cooking with via, on our produce, so fruits and vegetables, whether or not if I was buying it from the store or using it from what we had grown. And that is the base that I recommend that everybody does when you're planning on what you're going to grow is to look at first what you're eating on a very consistent basis too, because that's going to make the biggest mm -hmm. difference you know, in your health, in your grocery bill, all those things. And I and look at that and kind of document it and be like, okay, well, I'm on average using, you know, four cups of tomato sauce per week in my cooking. And then you're going to times that by mm -hmm. four to get a monthly average or track it. If you're a tracker, a meal planner, track it for a month or two weeks. And then just do the math until you get an average of what you would do for a month and then times it by 12. And that's going to give you a rough average um, on how much your family is consuming because how much your family is consuming of something is going to be different based on its size and your, even your eating right. is than what my family is. But then you're able to take what that amount is and just go straight to the chart and see, okay, well, based on that amount and how much yield you get on average per plant, this is how many plants I need to put in for a year's worth of food for my family. And then we break it down further, which you and I both have mentioned climate and if it grows in your area. And so then it's taking into consideration, I might eat a lot of this food, but does it grow well in my climate? And for me, I think it's probably similar to you, Carolyn. I, we're not warm enough to really do sweet potatoes, um, citrus, yeah. or okra. So even though I like citrus, and I actually really love sweet potatoes, I know that that's not one of the crops that I'm going to be putting a lot of attention to um, and trying to grow. I'm going to be focusing on the things that are much more suited to my growing climate um, than things that aren't. So kind of walking through that as you're thinking about those crops and doing your planning too. Um, so you can put your energy and get a lot of yield out of something without a ton of extra work is my goal. I kind of say sometimes I'm a lazy gardener. A better word is, better word is I like to be a strategic gardener. So I'm not putting in a lot of extra time. <laughs> Most of us don't have a ton of extra time, especially during harvest and preserving season. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really wise uh, thing there to grow. Focus on what grows really well in your area. And I know Josh and I, it's actually me. It's my, it's me. I'm always trying to push the boundaries on things. I love okra. I love okra. And so here in North Idaho, I put a tiny little quarter row this year to okra, just hoping and crossing my fingers. I got the saddest okra. Like each plant looked like a stick with one little okra sticking out the top. It was so sad. And I was really glad that I didn't put a lot more effort or garden space into that because there just was zero yield on that compared to something like the peas or the green beans or the broccoli that was just, you know, coming in in, in huge amounts. And, you know, I think another aspect of this is something that I see a lot, and I know I'm prone to this, when I'm looking at these beautiful garden seed catalogs, and I'm thinking about what to grow, I, I have a tendency to like idealize things like, oh, it's going to be the perfect year. And my children are all going to love all the vegetables that I grow. And you know, I think it's important to really critically look at where you actually are. If your family doesn't eat a lot of greens, but you want them to eat more greens, just because you grow three rows of them in your garden does not mean that they're going to magically start eating them. <laughs> so, you know, it's good to start where you're at, start with what grows well, and then slowly start to make those changes year by year instead of just trying to throw it all in there. 
Yeah, I totally agree. And, and when it comes to the raising a year's worth aspect, because um, I know Carolyn and I try to do that with a lot of our crops, and that's a lot of people's goals. Like I said, I started with raising a year's worth of one crop, and I was growing other things, but not a year's worth, and that was the, our green beans. And then I added in a year's worth of tomatoes, and then it was a year's worth of garlic, and then it was a year's worth of onion, you know, and, and added to that. So now that we're growing a lot of crops, a year's worth, but I just wanted to, to stress that, that that's not where most people start out. And you can grow multiple things, and I encourage you to do that, that what will grow in your garden soil. But if you've never grown a year's worth of something before, pick the two crops that grow well in your area and climate and that you're eating mm -hmm. a lot of and try to grow a year's worth of like one or two things and then each year increase and build up until you've got multiple things that you have a year's worth. But if you try to sit out and grow a year's worth of all of the produce that you eat, you're likely going to be very, very overwhelmed um, and you're just not going to be able to do it or to keep up with it. And then you're going to get down on yourself and you might not want to garden the next year. And, and our goal is to have us doing this, you know, year in, year and out and making it a lifestyle. So I just kind of wanted to stress that, like, don't feel all of a sudden you have to grow a year's worth of everything in your garden because that's not very realistic. You want to build to that. Well, there's this funny thing that happens after you grow a year's worth of food in your garden is that you have to preserve a year's worth of food in your kitchen. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, it, it's good to learn that part incrementally too, because even for someone who's been doing it for year after year, I get overwhelmed and I have to, you know, pull out all all of my different tricks to be able to not be overwhelmed say the last week of September or whenever it is in your climate that you really get hit and um, there's a lot of techniques to space out harvest and to do different things but if all those things come in at once it it is a lot of food and a lot of work in the kitchen so it's a good thing to start like you're saying one or two crops that really need to come in and get preserved is a great introduction to that and help you kind of get your feet wet know what you're up against before you add another thing into that mix. So good. So Melissa, do you have other great tips for us? I know some of your great tips for uh, planting your garden. Yeah, the other thing that I want to speak to, because we were talking about those seed catalogs, and I'm like, you man, those seed catalogs come in, and I'm like, oh, I just need an afternoon and a cup of coffee or tea, and I can spend hours, kind of like you said, daydreaming and picking out and drooling over them. Uh -huh. I love that. But one of the really important things when you have determined what your crops are that you're going to be growing based on your family's uh, likes and your climate is then looking at the varieties within those crops. So, for example, you know, within your, your winter squash varieties and even your tomato varieties, if you live in a northern climate like Carolyn and I do, where we have that shorter growing season, mm -hmm. we're going to want to look at varieties that say do well in cooler environments. And not all varieties will specify, but a lot of times peppers will say either, you know, does well in drought, you know, that's something probably is going to do more well for you in the south or needs a lot of heat. Even within varieties, there's nuances in the different kinds of these crops. And so I always look for something if it says does well in a cool environment or a wet environment. And then the other thing I look for is the days to harvest. So from the time I plant the seed, not all catalogs and seed packets, but a good many of them will tell you. They'll say like 120 days or 85 days. So that means on average, again, this is average, but averagely from the time <laughs> the plant is planted and the time you get to harvest it, that's about approximately how many days. So if I'm looking at tomato varieties and one says 70 days and one says 90 days, I'm going to lean towards planting more of the 70 days so that I have that longer harvest window before my frost hit. Same with my squash and those type of things. So those are some kind of like little nuances when you're looking at your crops and you're picking those seed varieties. Those are some things that you want to consider that are going to give you a better yield and the plant's going to grow. Remember that strategic thing? You're not going to have to do as much work usually with varieties that are suited to what your growing climate is. So just kind of take that into account and don't get swept away by the gorgeous, beautiful photos that they have. Um, still, you know, if there's something you really want to try, like Carolyn wanted to try this section of that okra, your garden is your 
your landscape, right? To, to paint and to play with. And I think that creativity and trying something new and fun we should do, but do it on that small scale um, so that you aren't sacrificing your actual crop for the year on something that's a little bit more of a gamble. So that would probably be my next tip um, that you really want to pay attention to during that planning and seed buying phase. Absolutely. I really like that. I know, um, yeah, like I said, when I look at those seed catalogs, I just, I want to plant every single one of them. I get so excited about all of these different plants in the garden. And, you know, the joke in my house is that I couldn't care less about buying shoes. I really don't care that much about buying clothes. But I have seeds stashed in every corner of our house. Like, I've got these collections, and I won't get rid of them, even if they're old. I'm like, oh, no, I might want them someday. <laughs> so, you know, I, I love this, though, because you can really quickly, I can really quickly, with that mentality, spend a lot of money on seeds that are not necessary. I end up with way too many every day year. And so if you work backwards from your consumption and your space, working with the plants that work well, you can really start to dial in how much seed do I need to buy or do I need to save in order to feed my family the next year. And I think that that is so good because there are a lot of places where um, you can really spend money in the garden. And I know for Josh and I, it is uh, we, we strongly believe in bringing in good amendments at the beginning because you're going to get your money out of it, even if you have to put money into your garden at the beginning. So save the money on the seeds, get good quality seeds, but don't get more than you need and uh, put that money into getting your soil really vibrant and healthy so that the things you do grow, grow really well. Yeah. We're right at that 30 minute mark, actually. <laughs> Right at the 30 minute mark. Okay, great. So you guys, I am going to put a link to Melissa's book down in the description. And Melissa, did you say you have some goodies for people who go and buy your book? I do have some goodies for people that get the book. So you can order the book from any online retailer or bookstore uh, that's around you online or in person. And then if you go to familygardenplan.com. I have some really fabulous bonuses that you're going to be able to claim and to get. And one of them, we were, we're, we've were been talking about seeds. And I was saying how we always grew green beans growing up. And my family has seed saved uh, two different strains of green beans for over a hundred years, going back to my great and great grandparents. And wow. so seed saving is near and dear to my heart. I love heirloom seeds and I love seed saving. So one of the bonuses is a seed saving 101 video and ebook package where I walk you through over a seed saving video series with download guides and charts on how to begin to seed save your own seeds so that you can save even more money by not buying your seeds again, even from a catalog, unless you just want a new variety or want to. And so you'll have <laughs> more money, like Carolyn said, to devote to that soil health and the, in a healthy foundation of your garden. So that's just one of the bonuses. And the other bonus, um, Carolyn didn't even know this, so it flew so nicely into that or flowed, I should say, is a, a organic soil amendment guide. So this is a, a detailed guide and all using organic and natural elements to amend your soil based on the major macro and micronutrients. So pH level, which is not a nutrient, but it is important when it comes to our fruit and our vegetables, your pH level, your nitrogen level, and then going through all those uh, major micro and macronutrients like calcium and phosphorus and boron and iron and there's a whole list there. So it walks you through knowing how to amend your soil if you have too much or too little and what that, com that nutrient, why it's important to your plants and some more specific plants than others. Um, so you have a great understanding and you can know exactly how to get your soil in tip top shape. So those are two of the bonuses um, that you get when you order the book to help you build a really right. garden. That's really exciting. Okay, well, and in the book, there are quite a few charts, but there's also a worksheet or two that you can copy to help you work through some 
some of those numbers, figuring out how much your family needs for a year and thereby how much to plant and how many plants to get in the ground. So that's going to be super helpful to give you the best gardening year that you've ever had. I'm really excited about that. So Melissa, thank you so much for joining us. And um, hey guys, next Pantry Chat, we're doing another Q&A session. So make sure you get your questions to us. Um, I get, if you have questions for Melissa, get them to me and I'll see if I can nudge her and, and get a quick clip on uh, her answering them for us because uh, I think I can grab her again for a minute. So um, get me your questions and we will be looking forward to seeing you guys hanging out with you next time on the next Pantry Chat. Thanks again, Melissa. Goodbye. Bye guys.